listening to Stories from Real Life, a podcast by engaging storytellers for engaged story listeners. Here's your host, author and journalist, Melvin E. Edwards. Hello, and welcome to this July 9th edition of Stories from Real Life. I'm your host, Melvin E. Edwards. John Williams will tell us about more about today's guest, Jonathan Jans. Jonathan Jans is the pen name of Craig Schaefer, an American horror author of 16 novels and one collection of short fiction. In 2011, Jans published his debut novel, The Sorrows. The book received praise from author Brian Keene, who called it, quote, the best horror novel of 2012. Keene would also describe Jans as one of the best writers in modern horror to come along in the last decade. In March of 2023, Jans won the Wilburn Thomas Award at the Scares the Care event in Williamsburg, Virginia. This is a charity event organized by author Brian Keene, and the award is given to authors who have helped other writers and their community. When he's not Jonathan Jans, horror author, he's Mr. Schaefer, a high school English, film literature, and creative writing teacher in Indiana. He currently resides in Indiana with his wife and three children. You won't want to miss how his students finally learned that mild-mannered Mr. Schaefer was also famous writer Jonathan Jans. Now, for today's episode of Stories from Real Life, here's your host, Melvin E. Edwards, with Jonathan Jans or Craig Schaefer. Or both. Thank you, John. Jonathan Jantz, or Craig Schaefer, or whoever you are, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much, Melvin. <laughs> awesome to be here, my friend. I'm, I'm glad to have you here. So before we start talking about Jonathan Jantz, the horror writer, I want to talk about Mr. Schaefer, the Indiana school teacher. <laughs> so what was it like at school when the local newspaper did the story on you and made your pen name public? That was super surreal. Uh, it was... <laughs> both exciting and it was also liberating and was also just a little bit scary. Um, I had students over the years who would kind of figure out what my pen name was. And I had, um, you know, my, my kids, I have three children and their friends would, they knew because they'd be at our house and they'd see my books on the shelves and stuff. And so, um, but that's different than actually having it public, right? Uh, cause either the kids knew from knowing us or they knew from doing some detective work, but then having it out there in the public was something totally different but i felt like it was just time um it was just time for because i'd i'd been writing under that i've been writing under this pen name for about 20 years uh before people like before it became public and so then when um i did decide to go public and let the local media know uh that was it was it, there was this moment where I was like, "What have I done? Maybe I sh maybe I should have just kept it incognito." Not because anything bad happened, just because that kind of safety net was taken away, and then people could associate me with my books, like the Craig Schaefer regular life person with the books that I write. So there there were little moments of panic, but mostly it was exciting. Mostly it was just positive. Um, a lot of like my a lot, a lot of my coworkers didn't know. I didn't know that they didn't know, but they didn't know I was a writer. Wow. So they started to talk about that. So that was pretty cool. My fellow teachers, um, and then students who maybe knew that that was my pen name, they felt then emboldened to actually ask me about writing and ask me about my pen name now that it was made public. Because before they kind of like tacitly kept the secret, and then they felt like you know like they could speak to me about it, which was surreal, but very cool. Yeah. You were Clark Kent before, and then you were able to be <laughs> your real, your real self after that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in, your, right. so in your mind, are Jonathan Jans and Craig Schaefer two different people? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, <laughs> in a way they sort of are. Um, it's weird. Uh, my wife calls it convention Craig because because uh, <laughs> she of course knows me as Craig and then I go to a convention and everybody knows me as Jonathan it's it's funny and I didn't do this for any like calculated reason 
but like all my friends in the writing world, like the friends that I know really well call me Jonathan because I think that's how they first knew me. So like uh, Josh Mallerman, one of my best friends, uh, Brian Keene, one of my best friends, they call me Jonathan. And so even though I know it's the same person, I feel like I just... I, I don't know. There is that little slight difference. Um, I think, you know, what's weird, Melvin, is that um, one of my wife's students put it really well. So my wife is a voice piano teacher and we share teach, we share students sometimes um, to where I'll, I'll have a kid in film lit where I teach high school and that same student will have my wife for like voice lessons. And uh, one of her students said to her, she said, you know, the real thing, the real twist was not students finding out that Mr. Schaefer is Jonathan Jans. The bigger twist was readers finding out that Jonathan Jans was Craig Schaefer because the readers mm. might not have known that I was a teacher. And I find that largely was the bigger like change. Like a lot of my readers didn't know that I was Craig. And so I think that that um, that, that l l di dichotomy, I guess, between those two, that's where it mostly existed, that the people at these conventions didn't know I was a public school teacher. And it's still slightly in my mind separate because of that. It's weird. <laughs> that, that's really interesting. Did, did your students think it was cool when they found out who you were and that they knew a well-known horror author? I think so. Yeah. I haven't run into any students who, th who, who like v say anything negative about it. Um, and then I've had a lot of students who, um, talk to me about it and they feel like it's cool and they, they seek my advice a little more because they knew before, like I teach two writing classes, a junior high writing class and a high school writing class, uh, for creative writing. And they would always, you know, obviously, we'd talk about writing every day in those classes. But then I think more so since that came out, they've been staying after class and after school to talk about writing and the career of writing, I think a little more than they did before, which is cool. Yeah. You got the street cred now. I think so. Maybe, <laughs> maybe a little more. Yeah. I don't think they thought, I don't think they thought I was a total, you know, um, fake before, but yeah, I think that that definitely lended an air of credibility, maybe another layer to it for, for, for a lot of kids or, or again, or, or they just felt like, you know, they must've assumed because I would say to them, they'd ask me my name, sometimes my pen name, and I'd, and I'd tell them I don't say my name and my pen name in class because I never wanted them to feel like I was trying to monetize my teaching. I didn't want them to think I was trying to sell my stuff. Um, but, you know, after they found that out, then then I think they're like, OK, now we can ask him. Now we can talk to him about mm, it more, okay. which was cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I asked if the students thought you were cool after that. Did you think you were more cool when, <laughs> because everybody you were exposed to all the, everybody in class in the school knew you? They, oh, knew, was, both, knew both of you that is <laughs> right 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 right. yeah it was it was really fun um it was exciting it still is it's still fun to like walk into school and know that it's okay to not like make it a secret i don't know that i thought i was any cooler i just i'm with myself too much to know because <laughs> i know how uncool i am <laughs> so i, I don't you've know got I, teenagers to remind you how that's uncool right. you are my my, my, my children <laughs> constantly are, are bringing me down to <laughs> down to earth so yeah no, I, I don't i definitely know how uncool i am <laughs> <laughs> so um you write in the horror genre yes so I, I'm, I'm curious what is halloween like at the schaefer household it's so exciting melvin <laughs> it's so exciting <laughs> um i think that the the anticipation is actually probably more exciting than the actual holiday because there is this spirit that kind of permeates the air i mean i don't know how it is you're down in texas right mm -hmm. um yeah i don't know how it is in in texas at that time like 
you know, with the weather and, and meteorologically, I know here there are very pronounced seasons. So the weather changes, it's a little crisper. You've got the leaves starting to change and it's a little gloomier, which is just awesome because it's not yet. It's only miserable in Indiana in January, February and early March. Other than that, I love the weather here. So October weather is just the coolest. Um, it's so nice. Um, and, and so you you walk home. I, we live in this neighborhood with this really cool, like rolling terrain. It's called the Hills and Dales. And so when I walk home from school, sometimes I'm only about six blocks from school. Um, I hear the music from um, it's I, I'm not going to hum it because I don't want to make, <laughs> make your ears bleed. But there's this there's this there's cue that John Carpenter wrote in Halloween. It's not the main Halloween. Th- of course, he wrote the music for the whole movie. But it's this like if you've seen Halloween a lot, you know, the music, it's kind of a little more moody when Jamie Lee Curtis walks through her neighborhood early in the story and you hear it's just piano and you hear this piano playing with a little bit of synthesizer coming in. And um, I hear that every time I walk through the neighborhood. So I start to hear that more often around Halloween in my head. And my, my youngest daughter wants to go to spirit Halloween and look at like, you know, look at costumes. My middle child, Juliet, she is this huge horror fan. So we watch even more horror than normal around Halloween halloween my son digs it too so i think it's that it's that real anticipation that just builds and builds and builds to a fever pitch on halloween we really don't do anything different (laughs) because it's kind of halloween (laughs) all year long so on halloween we will watch a scary movie like we usually do we'll we'll my my youngest will go trick-or-treating a little bit so we have candy um and then so yeah it's not it's not really a lot of pomp and circumstance on halloween because we we already were kind of in it, but it's definitely a cool anticipating and building up to it. So I wonder, you you write to scare people. Do you scare easily? I do. I do. I think that's part of why I like to think that my writing is more effective because I know fear really well. Um, my kids tease me. My, my kids were teasing me last night about how paranoid I am. Um, I see the world as kind of like a Final Destination movie. And so particularly when my kids were young. So it's like every dresser, every bookcase, every television, everything was bolted to the wall. I mean, I guess you're supposed to do that, but I was excessively like that. Um, I would constantly, every corner was fraught with danger (laughs) with me and the kids. And I, I I remain that way largely just because I just, I, I have a vivid imagination and it's not that I don't have any faith because I am kind of, I am a person of faith, but I, I just also, I feel like life is fragile and it can be taken really quickly. And so like uh, my, my youngest always wants to take our, our, our youngest dog. My youngest is 13 and she always wants to take our youngest dog out for a drive. When we go to get like, when we go to pick up the pizza or go to get ice cream or whatever, she always wants to take, and she loves to let the dog like stick her head in the window. Cause she loves to feel the wind on her face, which is awesome and cute. But I, I like look over there and I see that our little puppy, like she's not a puppy, she's six, but she's always a puppy to me. I see her straining to get more and more, like to lean farther and farther. And I'm thinking like, what if somebody hits us, right? What if there's a gust of wind and then our little dog's tumbling out of the car at 40 miles an hour? So I'm constantly worried about stuff like that, which I probably shouldn't be. So because I do know fear so well, um, I feel like I'm able to, to, to channel that on the page because <laughs> I'm constantly afraid of something like that. Yeah. I, th- I think that's the talent and also the curse of a creative person. Mm. I, I, I understand that completely. And uh, both, of the, both of the books I've written have been about my family's history, one on my mom's side and then the second one on my dad's side. And I wrote them from a first person perspective as if they were telling the reader the story rather than yeah. me telling the reader the story that they had, that the parents had told me and being able to get into that mold that mindset somebody else's mindset yeah. and think about that i i understand completely what you're saying like i can see somebody walking and imagine what kind of conversation they're having in their head <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's a weird it's a weird sensation but it's it's something that's probably required if you're a writer 
Yeah, I think it's one of our greatest assets as writers. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'll just echo, you do it extremely well. Uh, we are talking about your book, uh, Strength of a, Sa- a Thousand Sons. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're talking about that uh, prior to the show. And that's, if, if, listeners, if you haven't uh, read that yet, you need to. Um, I started the other day and it's just fantastic. Uh, but Thanks. Melvin, you, yeah, you really inhabit your character um, just completely, like down to the marrow, uh, down to the soul, which is, I think, what, I think that's what a great writer does. And you can really feel it. Like you can feel it when I think when it's not there too. Um, you can feel it when the when the writer is keeping the, the character at, at arm's length and isn't really living in those shoes or, or, or existing in that headspace. But when the writer is really going there and really channeling that and inhabiting that, I think that's really what makes the experience palpable and, and, and dimensional and immersive for the reader. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, re- I read somewhere that you grew up near a, a, a cemetery. Is, is is that something that has influenced your your thinking? Oh, absolutely. That's never stopped influencing me. I, I've I've from the very earliest. I, I, we moved into that house when I was about two or three. Uh, my mom and biological father. Uh, she divorced my my biological father when I was about four. Um, but we, we lived there for maybe two two or three years and, uh, yeah, that was my playground. I, you know, later on, I realized I probably, I was never like intentionally disrespectful of the graveyard of the people there. Like in the abstract, I knew that people were there. And actually I think I was really attuned to that because as you're talking about, like I would. I would think about like the name on this gravestone. I would think about that name and I would look at the year they died or the year they were born and imagine that and think about what their lives would be like. So I was aware that they had lived lives. I I was aware that they were living, breathing people. And uh, I I believe that they had, that they had souls. And I just, I just never thought of like stepping on that ground being disrespectful, right? Or running around that graveyard. I never thought about that being, being disrespectful until much later. And then I probably would have been more cautious about where I would tread. Um, But yeah, I think, I think that that, that experience living by the graveyard. Um, and, and I had so many experiences there. I would, uh, sometimes I'd, I'd walk through and get scared and have a horror experience at other times it would be kind of melancholy because it would, I would think about mortality. Sometimes I would, it would be a fun place because it would be bright and sunny and it was this vast kind of field and there was, there was a woods right next to it. And it was, you know, there'd be butterflies flittering through the air and, and flowers that people would play. And so then it would be a cheerful place. Um, so that experience, I think that I this sounds made up, but I was a sleepwalker. Um, I occasionally still sleepwalk, not often, thank goodness. I once awoke in the cemetery when I was probably Whoa. five or six. Um, my <laughs> my uh, my yeah, my mom found in that. I'm sure that was scary to her. I mean, it was just right out the door of the cemetery, um, just off our side yard. So. I I had so many experiences there. I was telling uh, somebody the other day, I once got in trouble with, when I was 10, um, I got in trouble with the police there because we talk again about not really uh, comprehending the sanctity of the space. I um, I would always have, we you talked about Halloween. So on my birthday is October 27th. So all my birthday sleepovers would be r- like Halloween themed because it was right around Halloween. And so I remember when I was about 10, I think I was 10, maybe 11, but I had a sleepover. I think I was 10. And um, we, the day after that, we, uh, there, there are these big white, puffy pieces of fungus. We, we would call them puffballs. I'm not sure what the actual scientific name was, but they were really like cool looking. And then once you, once you'd like, once, it, once they get a little like more decayed, you could hit them and then they, they emit all these spores and dust. But like when they're white, they're kind of fluffy and spongy, but then we would like grab them and then hit each other with them because we were kids, right? <laughs> and uh, and then they'd become really slimy, and of course, then it's more yeah. fun to hit each other with them. And we were having a big puffball fight when we were ten years old, and we weren't thinking of anything but just hitting each other with these wet, spongy, slimy pieces of of mush, and uh, we were like a half hour deep. And uh, and then and then we see this figure approach us from over the hill in this graveyard. And it was a policeman, and we knew enough to to stand to attention, and we knew enough to know we were in trouble. And he's like, "Fellas, come here." 
and he like walks us up the hill and he points to one of the gravestones and there was some <laughs> some puffball slime on one oh, of the gravestones. No. Like, do you guys think that this is respectful? And, and we immediately like the waterworks turned on because we we just hadn't thought of it that way. We we weren't thinking about this being someone's loved one or something like that. And we're like, oh my gosh, we're so sorry. And you could tell he was getting ready to really lay into us. And but we started tearing up and, and apologizing. He's like okay 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 you go inside you get you get some soapy water you clean this up and we'll forget about it and you won't do it again right we're like no officer we won't we swear. we're so sorry and i think that probably was the moment that i realized <laughs> that i should this is real <laughs> this is real and i probably should approach this space with a little more <laughs> seriousness than i had before um <laughs> but thankfully that he probably had kids at some point and knew that we were just being idiots and not intentionally malicious. Um, but it was enough, man. The look on his face was enough to teach us. <laughs> Those looks when your kids, your parents didn't have to, sp- I don't know what your parents were like, but my parents never spanked me. Nope. But my mom had a look yep. that I was thinking, I trade that, I trade three spankings for her to look at me like like the look of disappointment was the worst it was it was 100 percent. that was it my mom my, and my grandparents raised me too and they, i never got spanked um and uh but i remember i remember one time i was a freshman in high school and i was i was under performing in a class and uh because i was i i was on the borderline of being ineligible for basketball and um and you know a couple of my teammates were in the same boat because they're in the same class and they were we were screwing around and we shouldn't have been and uh and and i I said to my grandpa i was like well you know it's not a very the teacher just kind of had she has it out for us it's not an important class in the first place and and that was the wrong thing to say obviously I, i was being irresponsible i was being a little jerk and uh and my grandpa i just remember he turned and walked back into the house he just ignored and and it i just he was such a warm loving man that when he when he walked away from me it was like i had been it was like a thousand spankings i just felt like the world had ended and i immediately changed and like got my grade up and 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 was eligible for basketball but like kind of like you said like when it's a look it's you know like when you really respect somebody and love them and they're disappointed in you that's that's crushing and uh and i guess that's a testament to how well my my mom and grandparents and this aunt i had how well they i mean i like to think they raised me well they did a good job if there's any error it's a thief, <laughs> right but i feel like that that shows that they had raised me relatively well because that that was enough i really cared about their opinions well you just gave me an idea for to, to suggest to you as a future horror novel in yeah. the title the look of disappointment. That would be the scariest book ever. <laughs> it would be terrifying. It would be terrifying. <laughs> so just, just think about that. <laughs> I like it. I like it, man. <laughs> All right. So who is your favorite author, regardless of genre? I tell you, this this guy, he is Stephen King, which probably isn't a surprise. No, um, Stephen, not at all. <laughs> not at all. But Stephen King, for me, that guy, he is, he's the one who, he, he made me a reader when I was 14. He made me a writer uh, when I was 17 or 18. But more than that, um, his impact on me was that he rescued my self-esteem. Uh, it's, it's so funny. You've heard the phrase, it takes a village, obviously. And, um, you know, I think there's so many people who are important to our uh, formative years and it's, they still continue. It's not like, it's not like we're a finished product ever, really. I feel like we continue to grow, hopefully. But, um, you know, no matter how good your, your, your family is, you need other voices, you need other people to help you out. And uh, King you know, my family was so loving and supportive. They were just awesome. But I just still felt like I wasn't very smart. Um, and part of that, just to be honest, I had a, a stepfather who, who who always spoke to me like I was unintelligent. Um, and, uh, and that really, really set me back because, you know, if, if, cause that, that's somebody who was always there. And if, and if he makes me feel like I'm an idiot, then I feel like I'm an idiot. So it was that. And a few other little things I, we, I'd changed school system, uh, systems between sixth and seventh grade. And, and this, the one that to which I moved was a little bit more challenging. So it was a combination of what I got at home from, from him to what I was 
you know, experiencing at school. Um, I was moved up a, l- a little bit too fast in, in math. Um, when I moved to that new school, I was in this honors math and I just wasn't ready for it. So I got, I got bumped out of that class <laughs> mid semester and that was embarrassing. So it was, it was hard enough to move di- to a different school, but then to like, you know, they, they weren't trying to be malicious, but my grade wasn't, it was like a C or a D. So I got thrown out of this honors math class and that didn't help. And so it was this combination. I just felt like I was stupid. And, uh, when, and I felt that way from like age 12, 13, 14 in junior high is tough anyway, by the way, that's like, for me, that's one of the hardest parts of life. And, uh, so I felt like I was an idiot and, um, I read, uh, I picked up a Stephen King book just on, on a whim, um, when I was 14, somewhere between my eighth grade and freshman year. And I picked up this book called the Tommy knockers, which ironically King hates King thinks it's his <laughs> worst book. <laughs> um, but I picked, I, I bought it one day and I took it home, not thinking I would ever read it cause it was super thick. And I, I, I had never read a book by myself to that point because I'd always felt like I was not intelligent. I, so I always like gave up, you know, the, on page two or three. But that book like captured me like no other book had. It just grabbed me. Not only did it grab me, but it, it um, I felt the characters. I understood the characters. I, I, I related to the characters. And I just, I started to feel, first of all, I started to feel smart for the first time because here was a book I, I could read and really grasp. And I also felt like I wasn't as alone because I, I these subtle feelings that only I had felt like, I mean, just, just little things, um, that like, you know, like suspicion and, and like fear and doubt and anxiety and things that people didn't really articulate very much. Um, I was, I was, these connectors, these, these, these characters were expressing through their interior monologue and stuff. And, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I felt like that. And so because these characters were expressing these subtle emotions, I felt less alone. I felt more understood, more seen. And so I think that was the real gift of, of Stephen king to me to make me feel not only understood but then to also make me feel like i was capable by writing in such a way that i was like swept along with the narrative and 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 i realized i wasn't unintelligent i'd just been reading the wrong books i'd been reading books to which i didn't connect so um stephen king will forever be the writer who just changed my life in so many fundamental ways for the better that's pretty cool. So now you've written 18 books of your own. So <laughs> if you had a chance to meet Stephen King, which one book would you recommend that he read, or at least to start the series? I've thought about that, Mel, and I've thought about <laughs> it a lot. I've thought about it. I've, thought, I've envisioned this sounds so pathetic, but I've like thought about <laughs> what I would say. I've thought about, you know, <laughs> do I shake his hand? I want to make sure the handshake is, I don't want to like squeeze too hard out of excitement. I like, I just, I've, I've, I've thought through that scenario a lot. Um, I, I feel like what he would appreciate is he, um, he's just a guy who he's read it all, right? He's read all kinds of books from all kinds of writers. I, I, I wouldn't think that I'd try to wow him. So I probably wouldn't try to give him one of my books that's more. So, so I wrote this book called The Dismembered, and it's written in the style of like, you know, 1912, 1915. Um, and I feel like I got that right. I feel like I did that really well, but I don't know that I'd give that to him just because I, I, I wouldn't want to like try to, I wouldn't want him to think I was trying to impress him with my word choice or erudition. I think that what I'd want to do is just give him one that would, that would show my heart. And so in that way, I'd probably choose like children of the dark. Um, which is written from a 15 year old point of view and influenced strongly, by the way, by like the body, you know, the, the stand by me novella that he wrote. Um, it's also influenced strongly by it. So I'd probably give him that one, something like that, that, that maybe isn't as flashy as far as its technique, but, but is definitely um, an expression of how I feel, how I think, who I am, where I've been, who I want to be. So probably that series I'd give to him just because I feel like it's reflective of me. And I don't know if he'd like it or not, but um, I I feel like it would be 
true to me and and i'd like to think that he'd it almost feels like linus like the most sincere pumpkin in the pumpkin patch you know, if, I, if i have a sincerest pumpkin it's probably that one so, so maybe he'd appreciate that <laughs> that's pretty funny and you, you mentioned it and i haven't mm-hmm. read the book actually i haven't read any stephen king books so i just horror no offense here. It's just not my genre. Totally cool. Totally cool. <laughs> but but um, the movie, I, I when I when I hear the the title of that book and movie, it just still creates a visceral response from me. Because when my daughter, what my oldest daughter was nine years old, she had um, her group at church had a lock in where they would stay in there all night, and they were supposed to be watching movies and like having a pajama party. And somebody thought it was a good idea to show them it. Oh, a group of nine-year-old girls. Oh, no. Oh, and so no. She, she scared in the middle of the night and called me and said, Dad, come pick me up. Oh, no. Every time I hear that, that title, I think about that story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So how Can did that affect her? Well, she hates, she's been scared of clowns ever since. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, it's one thing to like, you know, I, I feel like people, nobody knows a child better than the parents, right? And so I think that every child is different. And, and, and I can see that, you know, if you feel like your kid is ready for whatever, at whatever age. See, my mom, she had a very different approach than I do. She, because I differentiate it for each one of my kids. Like I show my kids different things at different ages, depending on where they are, because I know them. I know what they're ready for and all that stuff. And my mom, though, she, um, her thing was I could watch basically anything I wanted to as long as I watched it with her and we talked about it afterward. So she was just very open. And so that meant that I saw a lot of R-rated movies when I was little, but, but she, she held true to that. She would watch it with me. We would talk about it. And I don't know if it was good or bad or in between, but but it, it, she had a very she'd thought it through, I guess, is my point. Um, but to do that for somebody else's kids, I think that's a really <laughs> bad that's idea. A stretch. Yeah, yeah, that's a stretch in the stretchiest form. That's a problem because, I, yeah, I really <laughs> wanted my like not any of my nine year olds seeing that at that age. I just don't think that most nine year olds are ready for that because that is so scary and so disturbing oh my gosh i'm thinking about even just the opening scene the opening scene how does this stick? i bet she walks down the middle of roads to a stay away from the sewer grates right that is so scary i know it's just crazy to think about and that was a long time ago she's 33 years old now and i still uh, think about that and it's still, still i still have intense I still I'm still afraid of clowns, and I still have intense emotions about it when I hear the title. <laughs> I bet I bet you do. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, going on the theme of of films being created from books, which filmmaker would you want to turn one of your books into a movie? Ooh, great choice. I my fa- Okay, so my favorite director is Steven Spielberg. And I, I know I don't sound very original here, but the Steven, Steven Spielberg and Stephen King, probably more than anybody else, have they've influenced my life. You know, second, I mean, really right after them, I'd say like John Williams, the composer um, whose music still just I listen to on a daily basis, whose music just touches my soul. I think of George Lucas, Star Wars. I think of Harrison Ford and Mark Hamill. Like these are the most formative people for me. But like Steven Spielberg, his movies are always so suffused with heart. Um, And it's so funny, like people... (sighs) I think people do two things. One thing people do that annoys me is they, they, there's this really kind of, I, I, I know it's a cheesy phrase, but this edge Lord kind of attitude where they want to like, if something becomes popular, it can't possibly be good. Right. They want to say that it's, Oh, he's a sellout. Right. And the only, <laughs> the only, the only true artists are the ones that a few people know about. Right. And they, and they, I see that in music all the time. I remember that like guns and roses, I remember when they first came out, 
because like two of them are from right around where I live. Like Axel Rose and Izzy Stradlin are from Lafayette and I'm in West Lafayette, like 10 minutes from, from where they were born or whatever. And that when they came out, they were just so cool and everybody talked about them. But then when they got big and Appetite for Destruction went quadruple platinum or whatever, oh, they're a sellout. They're no good anymore. <laughs> and I feel like that's kind of what st- people are like with Steven Spielberg. It's like, it's not cool to say you like him because he's too popular, right? And, and I find that ridiculous. Um, and and an- another thing with Steven Spielberg, I feel like people are, they feel like he's schmaltzy. They feel like he's too saccharine or whatever. And they, they said the same thing about Frank Capra back when he was making like It's a Wonderful Life and stuff like that. And because they called his movie Capricorn. And, and to me, to me, it's like, what's wrong with loving your characters? What's wrong with because if you look at their filmographies, there are intensely scary or sad or heartbreaking or, or cynical moments in their movies. Uh, the end of one of Frank Capra's movies, Meet John Doe, in the original version, had um, Gary Capra, or excuse me, Gary uh, Cooper, leaping to his death. He took his own life in the original wow. cut of that movie. The studio made Capra change it. If you look at Spielberg's movies, he deals with some really dark, painful things things in his movies he you know schindler's list and 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 amistad he deals with some really awful painful terrible chapters in human history um and so i think it's really dismissive to say that he's just like you know puppies and unicorns and and all this stuff um i feel like that, that spielberg captures the gamut of emotions and the gamut of experiences but what i love about him i i think it's a positive thing that he also sees the good in people. I think it's 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 admirable that he also sees the goodness in people's hearts and the fact that there are people who who try to 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 to, to capture the, the humanity even in the bleakest of moments. So I, I find that to be a, an admirable trait rather than a reason to be dismissive of him. But getting back to, to full circle here, I would love for Spielberg to make, there's a movie I have, uh, a book I have coming out in uh, next year called Veil. Vale. It's a sci-fi horror movie. And, and I'd love to see it made by anybody, first of all. Um, and it's not been shopped yet to studios or, or directors or anybody else. It'll be shopped here probably within within the next six months. Um, but I, I uh, my dream director would be Spielberg uh, just because I, I just love – I love him. I love I love when he takes on sci-fi and with a little bit of horror. Like he did War of the Worlds. That was so effective. He did E.T. And that's obviously just more sci-fi. And, and I just love the E.T. so much. So that would be that would be incredible. All right. So if you had the choice just between meeting one of those two people, Stephen King or Steven Spielberg, which one would you choose? So hard. It's so hard. <laughs> But I would choose Stephen King. It would be very difficult, uh, but I'd probably choose Stephen King just because he's he's affected me. The, it's amazing, Melvin. I don't know how much you've thought about this, but isn't it amazing how people can affect us when, without even meeting us, without even knowing oh, yeah. them, how they can affect us, right? I mean, I know that you know you. Um, I, I think that you probably have a lot of those feelings. Uh, for a lot of people that have affected you in your life, I know that, that you're, you're somebody who cares about like your heritage and things like that. And I think that that's um, one way that people really affect us, you know, people who have preceded us in our, in our families. Um, but yeah, and in this case, he's a, he's still a contemporary, you know, King, I hope he lives 30 more years and, and keeps giving us great stories, but I would just love to tell him how thankful I am um, for him, just for him and how much he's given to me. That would be incredible. Okay. So if you did get a chance to meet him, would you introduce yourself? You would just say, hi, I'm Craig or hi, I'm Jonathan. I'd probably introduce myself as Jonathan just to, just because I, I would be approaching him as a, as a writer, um, just you know, not not to like you know push my work on him, but just like that's what he made of me, as he made me into a writer and a reader. So I'd probably introduce myself as Jonathan. That's awesome. So why did you select a pen name, and or why did you select the pen name you selected, and why did you think you needed one? 
Yeah. Um, well, the the reason I thought I needed one, and this this sounds cynical, and maybe it's my paranoia coming out, but I just um, people. It's funny. People hold to a degree. I understand this and, and embrace this. People hold certain professions, I think, to a higher standard. It's funny with teachers, you kind of get it coming and going because they don't want to pay you more. But they want you to they want you to be more moral and more upright and a better example than other people. We're not going to pay you for that. But you better do that. Right. Um, and so, you know, it's but it's also something I embrace because I do feel like working with young people. It is a supreme honor. It is a, a really sacred duty that we have to, to be a good example. And so, you know, for that reason, I'm always thinking about my students you know, my first thing is to my to my family. I think about them, and I'm just not like a, a whatever a reckless wild person anyway. Um, but I do think about them, and I think about my students with whatever I do. Um, but even having said that, like Joe Lansdale, who's a Texas writer, East Texas writer, he talks about writing writing as though everybody you know is dead, and in 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 that way, it kind of frees you and liberates you to just to write. Uh, and to just go and to, and to tell the truth on the page, whatever that truth is. And I feel like if I were constantly worrying about, oh, my, what are my students or more specifically what my students' parents are going to say about this or what my administrators are going to think about this, I would be debilitated by that that second guessing. I wouldn't be able to to just let myself go on the page. So um, I to be able to really be free on the page, I felt like it was important to be somebody other than Craig Schaefer. And then also just uh, from a paranoid point of view, um, when I first started teaching, I was 22 and I was in this, I don't know, I'm in Indiana and there are a lot of pockets of, uh, and I don't, I'm not trying to be cruel or too political here, but it's, it's a pretty conservative area from where I was from before. And, um, you know, right now we're seeing a lot of, um, people wanting to ban books, people trying to, to, to wrest control of the school board from, from, from the school and from, you know, trying to tell teachers what to teach and trying to tell teachers what to do. And I don't know, like I, I could just see a parent, I could see a parent saying, Hey, you know, I found this in your book. So therefore you must want to do these things or you must have these horrible thoughts or whatever. And, um, I just, I didn't want that. Um, there's this, there's this real, um, beauty, I think in the, in the student teacher relationship. Um, it's like, and I feel like my students for the most part have always understood that it's like, I want to help you, you know, I want you to succeed. And, and that's why I'm here. I, I'm, I'm not here to, to hurt you, to shame you, to, to, to tell you you're not worthy. I might, you know, at times correct you. I might even have to discipline you at times. But I do that because I care. I do that because I'm trying to help you have the best life you can have and be the best you that you can be. And I just never want, and I never wanted anything to really um, cloud that that beauty and that simplicity of that relationship. And I just felt like if, because I you, you, I don't know if, you, if you've ever encountered this, Melvin, but I've, I've seen people conflate the artist with the art. I've seen people with Stephen King. You know, there's a scene in It that's pretty notorious near the end of It. Um, and I've people, I've seen people say, you know, oh, well, King's just a pervert. He's just a terrible person because he wrote this stuff. And, um, you know, by all accounts, and, and believe me, I've read enough about Stephen King and I've seen enough interviews. He's a good dude. He's a good dude. He doesn't wish harm on any child um, or have any perverse thoughts about children. Um, that's not the point of the book. That's not the point of that scene. But but I saw people do that to him. And so that scared me. And I'm like, well, dang, you know, if people do that to King, they could do that to me. And I don't want people to do that to me. I don't want people to think that, that I have ill thoughts towards somebody or that I'm some serial killer in hiding. Or So I, I went with the pen name. Um, and I chose that pen name because, uh, Jonathan is my first name on, so my legal name is Jonathan Craig Schaefer. And then, uh, so the Jonathan was easy. And then Jan's is my mother's maiden name. So that was a way to honor my, my grandfather and my grandmother on that side who helped raise me. Um, and my grandpa's the greatest man I've ever known. 
And so I wanted to honor him. And my grandma was just extraordinary. And I wanted to honor her. So the Jans was a way to honor them. And the Jonathan. So, and I thought, also thought the Jonathan and Jans had a nice ring to it. Just had a nice rhythm. So it really worked out well. Awesome. And shout out to grandma and grandpa Jans, wherever, wherever they are in the universe. Yes. Thank you. Good job. Yeah, Good job. Absolutely. Yes. I think they All did. Right. So which is scarier for you, a deranged psychopathic character in your book or a Stephen King book or some other book, or sitting in the stands with your son at bat during a critical moment in a ball game? <laughs> uh, that, that real life experience. Yeah. Like real life, real life killers are terrifying, but, but anybody on the page, anybody in any book, no matter how well done it is, nothing matches the 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 accelerated heart rate i have when my son hits or pitches or when my daughter goes to 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 drive in her golf meet or when my other daughter gets on her horse there is nothing like the nervousness i feel when my kids are in those situations oh man i don't know how many calories i burn when my son's <laughs> up to bat he was just he just uh, a couple days ago played uh, he was an indiana all-star he's uh, just graduated from high school and uh, he got to play in the Indiana All Star Series as a three game series, and man, I mean, it was it was intense. I mean, you've got the fifty best players in Indiana, you've got guys up there. He the guy he faced in his first at bat was uh, this kid who's going to get taken probably in like the seventh round of the draft, and he's one of my son's friends. They've been friends since they were eighth graders, and they played uh, or they they have at least played messed around a little bit uh, baseball wise. And this kid is just an amazing pitcher. So my, here comes my son in front of all these people, the best of the best, and he's facing his buddy who's going to get drafted. And uh, I, my heart was in my throat. My heart was racing. I was sweating. It was intense, man. Yeah, there's nothing like that, is there? <laughs> no, not at all. And I've had all of those emotions and all those experiences. And yeah. it'll age you. I guarantee it will age <laughs> it you. Did. And it doesn't go away either. My uh, my son is my son is now 26 years old. He just yeah. got married about five weeks ago. And last night, like the night before today, I had a dream about him having a baseball tryout. <laughs> <laughs> and the weirdest thing was... Part of the tryout was for some reason he he needed a horse for the tryout. Okay, and and most of the time I raised him, I was a single parent, so I didn't have a lot of extra money, so oh. I I couldn't afford a race horse. So I just had to get any kind of horse I could afford, and then he trained the horse to run fast enough to help him qualify to make this this baseball team. This is this is oh. how anxiety inducing this is having kids who are athletes and, and you <laughs> wanting the best one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. and, and that's you said it it's wanting the best for them right you're more invested no matter what you do no matter what i do we are more invested in them i think than we are ourselves and we are you know more hopeful of their success and more it's not it's not being negative but we just we don't want their hearts to be broken we know how they'll feel if they'll fail. We want to avoid that. It's just all those feelings are so intense. There's nothing like it in the world. There's nothing like it. It, it is just, it's bizarre. Some, sometimes it's, it's just strange to me. I remember thinking there's nothing, if you're not a parent, nothing can quite explain to you how stressful it is, how anxiety inducing it is to ha for somebody else to have an event coming up and you're the one who can't sleep the night before. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's until exactly. you're a parent in that situation, you just can't understand it. No, you cannot. You cannot. <laughs> I, I think that's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. Um, and just to finish that little story, uh, when, when my son was up, he um, he had a good weekend and stuff. And and uh, but he in that at bat, there were runners on first and second. And uh, he, uh, the, the infield was shifted, playing him to pull. And uh, so the second baseman was right behind, basically right behind second base. And he just barreled it, like hit it so hard. It like, I think one or two hopped and it would have been through for a, for a run scoring single, but it hit it right to the second base. You know how baseball is, you know how much luck there is in baseball. 
or bad luck or good luck. And he hit it right <laughs> to the second baseman and they, and he flipped it. I think, no, actually, I think he stepped on second through the, through the first and my son's pretty fast. He was beating it down the line and it was, dad would have called him safe. Umpire <laughs> called him out double play um and so then that, that you know and so is is one of those moments where he did his job but had bad luck and got got out um but the next inning he made a a, a catch uh up against the wall kind of leapt against the wall and crashed against the wall and made a catch in right field so so they were good so it moments evened out. <laughs> it evened out it evened out it was there were good moments as well as bad and that's baseball man sometimes you're the windshield sometimes you're the bug <laughs> so he he got doubled up in the first step top half of the first but he made it a great catch in the, in the bottom half of the first yeah there's so many life lessons to learn and be taught in baseball oh, I, i'm God. convinced there the, the baseball is different from from other sports like you can you can hit a line drive 110 miles an hour straight out of fielder for an out or a double play and then That's you can right. hit a, you can hit a flare 50 miles an hour right on the chalk and get a a, a two run scoring double out of it right. and then and and neither one of them is fair but both that's of right. them are, are legitimate <laughs> that's exactly right if you are if you are going to baseball to look for consistent fairness consistent you're going to the wrong place right because it is it, there is so much chance involved there's so m- and i think that's so good to learn though i right because it's like that's how sometimes things are out of our control right bad things happen to us that and sometimes good things happen to us that we don't deserve <laughs> right just, just do think, your best all the time and hope the outcome is right. what you want it to be that's exactly <laughs> right that's, and i think that's that's the best thing about baseball probably probably hopefully that he'll carry with him forever that's and it's so true well, we're running out of time here, and I've, I've got one more question for you, and yeah. it's um, some advice for you to pass along to the audience. What sure. one piece of advice would you give somebody who has an idea, they think they have an idea for a book, but they don't really see themselves as a writer? What, yeah. would, what, would, you, what would you say to somebody like that? Well, I, I would. I, I know you asked for uh, one piece of advice. I would, I, I'm going to give you um, okay. as many I'm as gonna, you want. I'm going to give you probably three. Okay. Um, you know, uh, one, actually four, if I can remember all of them. Okay. So <laughs> first two are that you need, if you're going to be a writer, you need to read a lot. You need to write a lot. Um, and that's the thing. It's like the secret is there really is no secret is that you, you've just got to read a lot of stuff to know what works and what doesn't. And you've got to write a lot. Um, they say you need to write a million words before you start to find your own voice. And, uh, I agree with that for me, it was like probably, um, 1.2 million before I found my own voice. Uh, so I, I'm a slow learner. I'm a plotter, uh, P L O D D E R, not a plotter. <laughs> with I, I don't plot stuff not, out. Not a, not, a, not a deep state conspiracy theorist kind of. Right, person. exactly. <laughs> That's right. Definitely not that. Definitely not that. But I, I'm a slow, I'm a slow, um, steady guy. Uh, on the page, I just keep working, and get slowly better. Um, try to get 1% better each day. But 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 the point is, is that I, I work on my craft. I'm devoted to it. I read great writers. I try to learn from them. And then I write a lot. Um, and then I think next, I think that uh, it's important to um, – uh, Joe, Joe Lansdale, again, that's a writer I really uh, respect from East Texas. He says, uh, BIC, butt in chair. You got to put your butt in chair and you got to write. So many writers, so many people talk about writing instead of actually writing. And then once you actually sit down and you write, you are already ahead of most people because most people talk about it rather than doing it. And it takes a lot of work to do the work. Um, so once you start doing it, you, you make yourself right. Um, and it doesn't matter. It can be 50 words. It can be 500, whatever you write, just get some words down and that's a start. And then, and then you find what works for you. You find the schedule that works for you. And uh, that depends on your life situation. That's, that's just it. One size never fits all. Um, you have people who say, well, if you don't write every day, you're not a writer. Well, okay. What's your life like? I mean, were you born of the purple? I mean, yeah, if you've got a trust fund somewhere, maybe, maybe you've got all the time in the world. Most of us in the real world, we've got to work. All right. Most of us in the real world we weren't born with a silver spoon in our mouth we got to work right so as a teacher and as a father and as a husband i actually want to see my family i actually i need to, to teach you know i've got this stack of papers i can't write every day and that doesn't mean i'm not a writer but you know when i get a chance on a saturday i'll try to get up early and write and during the summers when i'm off a little more then i'll write
right. All right. And that doesn't make me any less than anybody else. Um, but, but the point is, is that at some point you do have to write. Um, and then the last thing I would say is this, and this is, I think a little more empowering. Um, I, uh, Chuck Wendig is this writer. He writes like all kinds of stuff, but he wrote an article called 25 things a great character needs. And, um, one of the ingredients, the last ingredient, and I show this to my students cause I teach writing. Of course, the 25th ingredient is you, the writer. And I think that that is sounds like I'm being cheesy. It sounds like I'm saying like everybody's special, all this stuff. But the fact is, everybody is unique. Everybody does have a story to tell. Um, and like, you know, just I was reading your work the other day, Melvin, and nobody could tell that story like you. Nobody has that those experiences. Nobody has that authorial voice. Nobody has that combination of experiences and knowledge and things that you bring to the table. And, and nobody has what I have either. Nobody grew up like a graveyard like I did. Nobody got, you know, spoken to by a policeman because of a puffball fight. Nobody <laughs> has the paranoias that I have. Nobody has the same exact dreams that I have, the same hopes that I have, the same fears and experiences. And I think that when we realize that our lens is unique, that we can bring something, we do have something to offer for other people and something to offer on the page. When we remember that, I think then we begin to feel like worthy of, of putting stuff down, of telling our stories. Um, because I think that, that, that people are, they, they, they need to understand that. And that's, by the way, this is a little bit of a, of a rant here, a super quick rant. But when pe people talk AI, I'm for AI if it helps like medicine, if it helps people get well, if it helps people like communicate better with, with like technology or whatever, you know, if it, if it, if it helps people's lives, I'm, I'm all for that in art. I'm not like, I don't want AI. I don't want to read a book written by AI, you know, AI, I think is supposed to make our lives better. It's not supposed to do the fun parts for us. Um, and, and, and I don't want to hear this, this collection of other people's voices spat out onto the page. Um, I want to hear you. I want to hear Stephen King. I want to hear a real person with real experiences because I feel like that's why AI doesn't belong in art because that's where I think people really shine. Um, and that's where I feel we can really tell these stories that are unique and sacred to us. And that's why I feel like we need to keep it out of it. But anyway, sorry about that little sidebar. No, that's that's a great way to wind down the episode. I appreciate you you adding that. So I, I do want to continue that conversation offline because that's that's something that I find really fascinating and, and personal in some ways. Yeah. So our, our guest this week has been mild-mannered Midwesterner Craig Schaefer, who's also horror author Jonathan Jantz. So Craig, thanks for being here and sharing your stories. It's been a pleasure to have you here today. It's been amazing, Melvin. Thank you so much for having me. I genuinely appreciate it. Thanks a lot. So that's it for this week's episode of Stories from Real Life. Join us again next time for another great storytelling journey. Until then, don't forget to shine your light wherever you go. And as a closing thought, I want to say happy fourth birthday to my granddaughter, Marcella. <laughs>